The firebender rose to his feet in a single graceful motion and stalked toward the door, only to be stopped several yards away by the chain that tethered him to the wall by one wrist. He snarled, glaring at Jet hatefully. So you decide to start showing off your pet? He spat, looking seconds away from simply melting his bindings off in his rage. Jed ignored him and turned to Sokka. We captured him a while back after he discovered our hideout. We couldn't let him go after that. Pipsqueak liked exploring the caves, so we already knew about this place for months. We had the door installed already and everything. Originally it had been to lock up a more dangerous assets, like the blasting jelly barrels. But we figured it could keep someone in just as easily as it could keep people out. We added the chain to be safe. He gestured to the setup nonchalantly. Seriously, nonchalantly. Like this was just a regular Tuesday for him. Holy crap, this was just a regular Tuesday for him. Shit was insane! The Earth Kingdom teen didn't seem to notice his companion's internal revelation and continued talking. For a while, we used him for training. He gestured at the clear marks of fighting and firebending that littered the cavern. It was great practice for fighting against firebenders. Most people never get to fight a firebender until it's life or death on the battlefield. They don't get an opportunity to really practice. To train against them. We do. That's why we were able to take out that camp like we did. I guess I never thought about it like that. Sokka said, still stunned. He felt like he should say something at this point. For a while, it worked, Jet said. Sure, we got a few burns here and there, but we were fighting better than ever. We were effective. But then... He stopped. He must have figured out what we were doing or something. He hasn't firebent since. The teen seized, glowering at the window. I refuse to allow you to use me against my people. Sokka jumped slightly. But was soon back peering in at the angry teen, who, sure enough wasn't firebending. Even in the flickering and weak light of the torch, Sakura could see the prisoner was covered in a monotony of discoloring bruises and healing scrapes. He stopped fighting and what? You guys just kept on trying to beat the firebending out of him? He asked, anger peaking in his voice. Jet let out a harsh bark of laughter. <laughs> what? Heck no. He lifted his shirt a little to reveal expansive bruising of his own. Kids got plenty of fight in him, even without the fire. Oh, uh, oh, Sokka stammered, as the boy started pacing the length of his chain, looking like a caged wolf orca. The Earth Kingdom team expression turned more serious, but isn't good as training as it was. We need to keep practicing against firebending if we want to stay one step ahead of them like we are now. We need this, Sokka. The younger teen squirmed uncomfortably his eyes never leaving the pacing captive. He really didn't like this. The way Jet said everything made it sound logical. It made sense. He said it like it wasn't horrible. But it was horrible. Was it? This was Fire Nation. It was a kid. A Fire Nation kid. This... He didn't know. What do you want me to do about it? He asked. His tone less belligerent than his words implied. He's good enough with hand-to-hand -hand that we can fight against us without bending because we're on equal level. But if we bring a bender in, he might have to bend again. Exactly. The firebender has stopped his pacing and gone back to sitting with his back to the door, snubbing them deliberately. It made Sokka's wonder if he'd been ignoring them when they first arrived, instead of unaware like he originally assumed. Sokka bit back a shiver. If he was alone in this place all day, he'd be desperate for someone to talk to. It would take a lot of strength to ignore anyone, even your captors. Somehow, this made him feel worse about the whole thing, and he scrambled for a way to get himself out of this. That wouldn't help you guys learn to fight firebending much, though. Jet shook his head. We just need to get him bending again as a start. We can worry about the rest of it once we get there. Besides, we could always watch the fight to learn what we can, even if it's not quite as good as one-on-one -on -one sparring. It'll help more than what we've been getting now. 
Keen stepped back and looked at Sokka. What do you think? Can you convince Aang and Katara to help? Sokka could literally not see a single way this would work. Katara would take one look at this. This chilly cell that never seen the sun, and the Vita kid chained to the wall, and her mama's saber-toothed moose lion would come out. Fire Nation or not, this wasn't something his brave, idealistic sister would stand for. The firebender would be one mother-related sob story away from being adopted. And Aang? Aang might burst into the avatar state on the spot. It would have the added benefit of finally getting the two of them to stop being so infatuated with literally everything Jet did, but... No. Sokka couldn't tell them about this. Until he knew how he felt about it. What he should do. He had a feeling Jet wouldn't like that answer, though. He had to think fast, give an answer that would keep Jet satisfied without actually promising anything. And prop skills don't fail him now. I don't know. This really isn't their thing, you know? I mean, Aang is a monk. He doesn't really do violence in the first place, and Katara... Eh, I think I could convince them, but, you know, given time. But I'm going to need a while, a few days at least, to, like, warm them up to the idea before I actually spring this on them, you know? We can't afford for you to waste time, Jet yelled angrily, his voice cutting across the echoing space sharply. The firebender flinched, Sokka barely catching the side of the movement out of the corner of his eye. The Wire Tribe team was suddenly very, very tempted to bring Katara out here after all. But no. No, this was still a firebender, the enemy. He was the plan guy. He could figure out how to do it the smart way. After he figured out what he wanted it to be. Really? The ponytail boy asked, voice purposely nonchalant and rimmed in mockery. Because it seems to me like you've gone a long while without being able to train with Sparky here. And it seems to me that unless I can convince Katara and Aang, you'll be going another long, long time before you can get to it again. Jet didn't reply to that and simply glared at Sokka angrily. So the younger teen continued. Time to bring it home. So I think you ought to give me the time that I need to do what needs to be done. Sound good, poofy hair? He heard a snort from the cell and Jet whirled. He banged a fist against the door in a wordless threat that let a ring clang in the air. But the prisoner didn't flinch this time. Instead, the team jumped back to his feet in a battle stance. You want to fight? The bruised boy yelled once more at the end of his tether. Why don't you jump in here and I can show this peasant just how much I can do without bending? Poofy hair. The boy smirked, throwing his head so that his own hair, stringy, patchy, and journey unhealthy, flopped behind his back. Sokka had to fight back a smile. Huh. He just realized. His gut don't trust reaction that he'd had ever since meeting Jet wasn't going off for this kid. Weird. Maybe it was because he was so obviously bad news, Fire Nation, Firebender with a bad temper to match, his instincts didn't think he needed to weigh in. Jet looked like he was seriously a few seconds away from actually going into the cell to throw down when Smeller B ran through the tunnels. Just heard the signal from the Duke. They had caught someone in the forest, but it was an all clear, so they must have handled it. But they'll want to debrief with you. Jet looked back into the cell reluctantly before nodding. Thanks, Smeller B. It's almost your shift here. Mind starting a bit early so that Longshot can lead Sokka back to the hideout? Sneers will be by with lunch in a bit. She shrugged, accepting that as the three of them made their way back toward the entrance. Sokka glanced back as they left to see the firebending team slump, as though disappointed, before settling into a set of smooth practice motions. Yeah, Sokka got that. He would have a difficult time sitting still after that conversation, too. Zuko bent his knees and started a traditional basic kata. One he could do in his sleep. He needed to move. He needed to be active after being denied the fight and action he craved. He didn't used to crave fights. He remembered that. Because he was prone to fits of rage, just as many firebender was. But he wasn't necessarily violent. He'd been confident in his abilities. He enjoyed learning new combat moves, but he'd never... He never desired violence. 
And that was all he had. Violence, fighting in this endless, monotonous cell. Well, it used to be monotonous. He didn't like that things were changing. It couldn't mean anything good. Zuko had been in this pit for what he knew was years, and Jed had never brought in anyone who wasn't one of his freedom fighters. Zuko hadn't even seen any of the other kids that are apparently part of Jet's pack, other than the hailer, Mediman. Until now. Because it was obvious this new kid wasn't Jet's. He didn't obey. He didn't have the yearning of approval that the freedom fires all oozed. He was an outsider. A visitor. Jet brought him in anyway. Zuko didn't like the implications of that, or the look in Jet's eye. Zuko finished the kata and started another, still a basic set. He needed his mind to be blank. He needed to try and think through this, understand the implications of what had just happened. He had to come with a plan, figure out what he could do. He couldn't do anything. He hadn't been able to do anything for years but sit in the dark and try and face whatever they sent his way. Anger rose in the team, his movements became sharper, more intense. He punched out his finishing move, felt his chi stir in response to his fury, though no flame came. He couldn't do anything. As Zuko started up another set, in his anger, his mind turned back to the conversation he'd overheard. We captured him a while back after he discovered our hideout. We couldn't let him go after that. <laughs> Jet made it sound like he'd been hunting them down, running around with threats and fireballs. The boy grimaced as he remembered the truth. He'd been banished from his home after disgracing his father and displaying cowardice in his Agni Kai. He was forbidden from entering Fire Nation territory, including the colony ports, where the Fire Nation ships were welcome to anchor. The captain of the ship escorting him was merciful enough to not drop him off in an Earth Kingdom port when he was wounded, helpless, and so obviously Fire Nation. The mercy did not extend to going out of their way to find a neutral port. Instead, he'd been dropped off at the edge of a stretch of forest, left leaning against the one rock sitting on the small sandy beach they stopped at. One of the sailors, an old crewman, had stuck a small bag into his pocket. Zuko had waited until the ship was far from sight before risking pulling it out. It had been a purse, nearly full to bursting, a single paisho towel, and a letter from Uncle Iroh. The letter had a list of towns and people who would help him, co-words they could use to convince him to help, and promised to wait for him at the neutral Kiyoshi Island in a few months' time as soon as he could go without rousing the Fire Lord's suspicion. Zuko had read and reread the letter a dozen times, memorizing every line and brush stroke. Then he set his hand on fire and burned it. It was the first firebending he had done since before the Agni Kai. For days he wandered through the woods, following the river. He had tried to be a good student. He studied. He'd never been as impressive as Azula, of course, but he had a good enough grasp of geography to know that he was near a fire nation called, called Gupayan. He knew that the river would lead him to the town's reservoir. Technically, it was illegal for him to go there. It was against the status of his banishment to be on fire nation soil, including colonies. But his eye had hurt so bad. The healer on the ship had told him that his burn had healed enough that the infection wasn't a high risk, but it still hurt. It felt like his father was still there, teaching him his lesson. Any time he moved, agony shot through him. Sounds on his left side were dulled, and he was terrified to try and lift the bandage. It was better to let the darkness be because of the bandages than anything permanent. The best burn creams were made in the Fire Nation. He wanted, he needed, something effective. Not whatever backwards Earth Kingdom peasants had cooked up in the past hundred years. He just... Hurt so bad, and he wanted it to stop. Zuko had been half delirious with the pain, staggering through the woods with lurching steps. His good eye was swimming, his hair plastered to his skin with sweat. He'd fallen, tripped on a rock. When he looked up, he'd been surrounded. Zuko could remember the panic he felt at the moment. He hadn't realized how small, how young most of the strangers were. He hadn't noticed the gentle smile on the leader's face at the sight of a child in need. He'd only known danger. He'd only known he was on his knees and someone was reaching a hand out toward him. The only thought had been, not again. He punched up, 
once sending a flash of fire at the Minera's figure before scrambling to his feet. The Freedom Fires had jumped back in their fear following the attack. For a moment, none of the children dared move. Then Jet had screamed, Firebender! And they attacked. Zuko would like to say he had gave as good as he got, but he'd been in so much pain, he hadn't fired but offensively in weeks, and his balance was off due to the newfound blindness and deafness on his left side. Movements into the fight, Judd had gotten a lucky kick across the left side of his face, and that was all it took. He would never if he had lost consciousness, but for the next moments, the world was empty beyond the harsh ringing in his ears and overwhelming pain. By the time he'd been aware again, he'd been thrust up so soundly he could barely twitch, let alone move. They had evidently decided what to do with him while he was still out of it. As he opened his eyes to see the smaller kids giving Jet quick salutes before running off. The Earth Kingdom team had knelt down beside the bound Zuko, placing a featherlight touch to the bandage on the side of Zuko's face. He froze, barely daring to breathe in light of the silent, effective threat. Listen, Firebender. He spat, as though the word were an insult. You lost, we won. I have no love for the Fire Nation. I do to your entire lot what you did to the Air Nomads, if I had half the chance. And your hair wrapped up for me like a present. You're in no position to test me. Do you understand? Zuga had forced out a yes, unwilling to nod and move his face. It didn't matter, as Jet added more pressure at his next words. Good. Then here's what's going to happen. You're going to sit back, listen, and not give us any reason to make your already bad day a whole lot worse. Got it? Zuko gritted his teeth, both against the pain and in fury as he sped out another, yes. This one filled with spite, malice, and the smallest flicker of flame. Jet had nodded moved his hand without a word and stepped back. The big one, Pipsqueak, had then thrown Zuko off his shoulder. The sudden movement had been too much for him, especially when added to his recent attack of pain and constant dizziness he'd felt since losing his left side of his face. He'd thrown up all over the larger boy's back. It was, in retrospect, the thing Zuko was most proud of doing that day. Jet had blindfolded him then, spitting out insults that the fire team barely heard over the ringing in his ears. Zuko was instead preoccupied with avoiding showing weakness by whimpering at the tight blindfold digging into his tender burn. The blindfold hadn't been removed until it was dropped onto a cave floor. The cave had been dark, lit only by a few scattered torches near where Smeller B and Longshot were moving boxes out of the storage space. Back then, he hadn't known what true darkness was. Pipsqueak was hammering one end of the chain into a stone wall and was still working on the last nail when Sneers came back in with a thin, nerdy-looking kid that ended up being their healer. Zuko had been galled to discover that the Earth Kingdom Burn Cream was nearly as effective as anything he'd find in their Fire Nation after all. New cream and bandages applied, iron manacle on his wrist. Zuko had been left alone to burn off all the ropes and wonder why he was still alive. That had been years ago. And he hadn't left the cave since. He hadn't seen anyone beyond those six until the Duke was considered old enough to join in on the special training. Just day after day of the same still darkness, broken only by the presence of one of those seven people who hated his guts. Until now, when Jet decided to start showing him off like he was a particularly exotic zoo exhibit. They hadn't even acknowledged him. For all that, they were talking about him. He might as well have been an interesting piece of art, or a yapping pet. There had been no answer to his questions, no reaction to his words. He was ignored, just as he always was. Until the end, that is. Zuko smirked and moved into an advanced kata. <laughs> Poofy hair.